Welcome to the Revolution Church of New York City podcast. Before we begin, we'd like to remind you that our ministry is supported 100% by listeners like you. Unlike most ministries, Revolution Church of New York City is not backed by grants from larger institutions. To make your 100% tax-deductible donation today, please visit revolutionnyc.com slash donate. You can also read more by clicking the Donate section on our website to learn more. Thanks for listening. Is the Bible fixed and uh, un- uh, unalterable, uh, alter, 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 unalterable, unalterable, truth can we not alter the bible <laughs> is the bible fixed i'll just should i wait for an answer <laughs> yeah it's rhetorical you got me <laughs> um i think I, I was writing down some different things and i i think saint james or james the brother of jesus uh would probably say it was fixed I think he would probably say, eh, it's pretty tight down, I mean, until my brother came, and then, you know, but it's we're keeping it down tight. I think um, Peter uh, would probably say something that wasn't really either one way or the other, and he would say it in a really cool, emergent way, so you kind of had to read through the lines that, you know, oh, no, it's cool, it can change, and then, but for the people who aren't in the know, they'd be like, oh, he's just towing the party line. Peter seemed to like to um, keep keep his avenues open. <laughs> um, most of us know that Jesus would have said, yes, it's changed. I mean, he, Jesus changed it. Um, and a lot of the scripture and the law, um, the people would say, well, Jay, that's Jesus. He's allowed to do that. <laughs> um, well, then explain this, if you will. Paul used scripture the way he saw fit um, for his time and his message. You know, he would take a lot of the violence out of the Old Testament scriptures when he would use them. He would just leave out just huge sections, <laughs> uh, just like Jesus would. And uh, it's just so funny because I think about when when people do that, or even if people just have a certain message that's not um, orthodox necessarily, people start saying, oh, you're just picking the parts you like, or you're just doing this or doing that. And it's like, well, actually, I come from a long line of that. And, I mean, Jesus did that. Um Paul did that. Um, I think if you even read into some of James and Peter, they do that. Um, even though they might not come straight out and say it. But I think Peter is a good example. So I wanted to talk a little bit about Peter. And um, Acts 10. I I think I can feel it. Can you guys feel it? I can feel it. I wish I had a wig on. Um, <laughs> I can't believe it's not butter. Um, Acts ten nine. About noon the next day, as they were on their journey and, appro- and approaching the city, Peter went up to the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while in a trance... He saw the heavens open up and something like a large sheet coming down, being lowered to the ground by its four corners. I always think of a hobo bag when I read that. I don't know why. Um, In it were all kinds of four-footed creatures and reptiles and birds of the air. Then he heard a voice saying, Get up, Peter. Kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord. I love that. Peter is keeping it real. (laughs) I don't care, God. I'm not going to do it. Um, Jesus who? I don't know the guy. Um, But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is profane or unclean. The voice said to him again a second time, What God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened in the three, three times, and then the thing was suddenly taken up to heaven. Three times, a little nod to his denying and feed my sheep thing. He's like, I thought this was about forgiveness, God. Can you let it go? (laughs) That was a good laugh. People will hear that. Thank you. (laughs) I think people think I sit in an empty room and laugh at my own jokes. (laughs) Um, 
Now, while Peter was, was, was greatly puzzled by this, to what to make of it and thinking of it, um, he had seen suddenly the, suddenly the men sent by Cornelius appeared. They were asking for Simon House. They were standing by a gate. They called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about this vision, the Spirit said to him, Look there. Men are searching for you. Now get up, go down, and go with them without hesitation, for I have sent them. So Peter went down to the men and said, I'm the one you're looking for. What is the reason for your coming? Um, they answered Cornelius, a centurion, an upright, upright and God-fearing man who is well spoken by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by the holy angel to send for you. Come to his house and to hear. <clears throat> come to his house and to hear what you have to. He wants to hear what you have to say. So Peter invited them and gave them lodging. Now I'm going to skip a few just for time's sake. On Peter's arrival, Cornelius met him and falling at his feet, worshipped him. But Peter made him get up and saying, Stand up, I'm only immortal. And as he talked with him, he went in and found that many had assembled. And he said to them, You yourselves know that it is unlawful for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone profane or unclean. So when I was sent for... I came without objection. Now may I ask why you have sent me? Sent for me. Now I think this is interesting because you have he gets this this vision about food, you know, and he's thinking I'm not going to disobey that law, and it's like any it's deeper, you know. Um, I think that's what we miss in the Bible, all, like a lot of different metaphors and things. Um, it's not always about exactly what it's talking about, but sometimes we take it too literal and make it into something else. Um, it's it's really funny to see what we, uh, in our own time, pick and choose to take as literal, and then what is a story, you know? It's like, the stories about hell are have very interesting ways of talking about it, like a field and the separating wheat and chaff and all that stuff. We don't take that part literal, but then we take like the last part literal because... It works for us. It's really strange how we pick and choose things. Well, this is what Peter's doing. Peter's like, "What? I'm going to come. I'm not supposed to be at these Gentiles' house, but the Lord has told me um, not to see anyone as profane or unclean. Now, I often wonder why don't literalists of the Bible take this literal? That's not a verse I hear a lot of literalists use when they're screaming and yelling at people. (laughs) You know what I mean? Or when they're separating from people. You don't hear them say this. Um... And that's too bad. But what happens here is Peter has this vision and is saying, no, Lord, never. He's shaken by it. Doesn't know what to do with it until someone comes knocking on the door. And then he has to live it out. He's forced to go to the Gentiles and reveal what God has spoken to him. I'm going to try to catch a little bit more of this. Oh yeah, this is the best part. If you jump down to 34, 34, if you jump down to 34, he says, Then Peter began to speak to them, I truly understand that God shows no partiality. So we have it twice there that you see God has no favorites, doesn't want to see, you know, no partiality, doesn't want to see uh, uh, anyone treated unclean or profane. And... This is altering of of the word. This is the altering of the Bible. When he says the law, he's not being like, I'm going to get arrested if I come into your house. What he's saying is, is, you know, I'm breaking ceremonial law, which Jesus did all the time. I mean, Jesus, I, I often wonder if, you know, when we always say Jesus was sinless, but I think we always see that in such a New Testament way, because the Old Testament, just going into the house of Matthew, would be a sin. Ever think about that? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he'd be ceremonially unclean, which would somebody he'd have to go get washed and stuff, and he didn't do that. So I always thought that's kind of interesting that people don't talk about that. Um, I can tell by the sheer silence in the room, you guys are shocked as well. Um, so we see Peter take this change. Um, Paul also does this. Um, but remember, even Jesus said, you will do greater things 
and me. Do you remember that? Jesus, before Jesus takes off and flies away, He says, I tell you today, <laughs> you guys will do even greater things than myself. Um, so you're seeing this kind of like new idea of equality. You're seeing this kind of idea of no one's their favorite. No one's partial. No one's. I mean, even Jesus is saying, you know, there's more planned. Um, and I think that's really interesting. You know, um, then you got Peter who said, you know, God shows no partiality. And then if you go to Paul, check out Paul in Galatians. Galatians 2, 6. Uh, I'm going to start with 4, though. But because of our false believers, scrutiny brought in who slipped into the spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus so that they might enslave us. This was demanding that he might have one of his his guys circumcised who was with him. We did not submit to them even for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might always remain with you. And from those who were supposed to, or from those who were supposed to be acknowledged as leaders, I'm going to start even earlier because I think it's really better if I start earlier so you guys get it. Here we go. But even Titus who was with me was not to be circumcised though he was Greek. But because of his, these false believers secretly brought in one who slipped in to spy on us, basically, I guess, showering or bathing or something, in our freedom we have in Christ Jesus, so that they might enslave us, basically saying so they might put us back under the law. We did not submit to them even for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might always remain with you. And from those who were supposed to be acknowledged as leaders. Now, I have an idea that he's probably talking about James's guys because it goes on where, where um, Paul struggled with James a little bit, and I think James struggled with Paul a little bit. And, um, and you see that. But he goes in from those who were supposed to acknowledge leaders. What they actually were make what what they actually were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those leaders contributed nothing to me. So, he's talking about when the time when he went and talked to the disciples, basically. And he says, basically, in other translations, he says, I'm no respecter of man. You know, I don't care what their, their, who they were, or who they were with, or what their leadership is. You know, I've got my own calling. So, once again, you see something that's kind of like, you know, we don't think about every day. But, you see what I'm saying is, these guys are saying, God shows no particulars. Um... You know, Peter's saying, like, I'm no better than you, so I can come in here. You know, I'm not going to see anybody clean or unclean like this. Paul's saying, you know, I've been with, like, the 12. And, you know, one of them wanted my buddy to get circumcised and, and do all this crazy stuff. And we just didn't do it because God has no favorites. Um, but then we turn around and say, well, God had favorites. These really special guys who wrote this book. Because that's what happens when we say the Bible is fixed and we're un, un, uh, unchangeable. When we say the Bible is unchangeable, unalterable, th- we say that these guys somehow had a, a view of God that we ourselves can't have. And that they somehow fixed God in a way. So... God shows no partiality. Unfortunately, or fortunately, I guess, uh, humans do and have in the past. We've taken part... It's like we've taken part of the puzzle of... of uh, yeah, but I'll get into that in a minute. So we have a new truth. The new truth is, God says, see, no one is unclean. Gentiles are welcome. All are equal. You can be in their presence. Um, we have a new truth that that there is really no hierarchy in God's eyes. There's just people who do jobs and play parts. Okay, so we've got that there. Um, now, all these guys were eventually killed for different reasons. Um, but I think a lot of it has to do with new truth makes so many religious leaders nervous. 
You know, and the question is: Is do we have this kind of temporal truth that changes? Do we have this kind of you know? Because Christians, we're we're particularly known for um, when we claim only our answers are true, for claiming only our answers are true, and that all others are errors. And that's a big Christian message. We're right, and everybody else is wrong. Bless their hearts. And some people do that in a really nice way, and some people do that in a really harsh way. But the fact is, is we're right. Everybody else is wrong, and I, you know, oh, the humility of Christians is really beautiful. Um, it's, we seem to like have not realized things Jesus did or said. You know, sometimes I, I really think it's extremely interesting how we interpret Christianity and what it's become, and how it probably doesn't look a whole lot like what it probably was in meant to turn into um, I mean I guess the church was plan B anyway um, Jesus coming back plan A um, <laughs> um, but when we claim that all our answers are true and, and everybody else is there there's no room for growth or change um, the truth has been monopolized and it's been monopolized by us now monopolies always become arrogant they become too big to fail. Unsinkable Titanic. <laughs> that was today, right? It's today, yeah. Yesterday. yesterday. It's, it's today, yeah. <laughs> Last night. Um, there's this pride and there's this, you know, we're too big to fail and and you kind of see where we got, where that got us. You see where monopolies get us. There's a reason that monopolies are legal. There's a reason that the game monopoly is really long and frustrating. Um, <laughs> I never figured out how to buy houses correctly, <laughs> and I'm always out first. Um, so I think what people see is in the church. They see, you know, we we we. I use these first few examples to say, look. Things change. People change. Equality. Okay? I mean, and in Galatians, it's the same book that Paul, I mean, he rebukes Peter in it because Peter doesn't want to sit with Gentiles. And I don't know, I'm guessing this was after the Acts story. You know, so that's where I get the idea of Peter kind of always like, oh, James, because a bunch of guys, a bunch of followers of James show up and all of a sudden, Paul goes, oh, I can't eat with the Gentiles right now because they'll judge me. You know, I'm freaked out. So he does that. And even like, Paul's best friend and, and number two, Barnabas, goes over and does the same thing. And Paul just goes irate. You're like, oh my gosh, what are you guys doing? You're throwing everything away. You're ruining it. You know, Paul was not afraid to just go up to Peter, the rock, as, as some people called him, but probably mistranslation. And um, <laughs> uh, came up to him and, and had a discussion with him and, and, and rebuked him and said, we can't do this. Um, so there we see a change there. What we see is Jesus saying new things are going to happen. We see Paul and Peter and uh, you know all these guys saying you know, there's new things, new creations, new stuff. And then all of a sudden we go, the Bible's fixed. It's unchangeable truth. Um, now I think what we have to look at is, is truth in, in a particular way. Um, contingent truth. Does anybody know what contingent truth is? <laughs> or I was calling it temporal truth, but I like contingent better. Um, man, you know, when these guys were writing this, there was probably an idea that men could not fly. <laughs> Nor will they ever have the ability to fly. You know? Um, and that was the truth. Um, but now if you were to say that today, that would not be the truth. This is a pretty lame way of showing doing this, but we're going to do it anyway. It's very simple. Um, we can fly. The truth has changed. Um, r- recently I was reading, uh, just yesterday I was reading Time Magazine because I'm an in- intellectual. Um, no, because they just get me with their religious covers when they put those on there. Like, heaven is changing. It's like, oh my gosh, I want to read about it. <laughs> um, gossip. Um, that's my gossip rag. We're talking about heaven. Awesome. Um <laughs> <laughs> there was one that Jesus had a leather jacket on just recently. I was like, oh yeah, <laughs> I like what I'm seeing. Um, but they, they were talking about how some archaeologists recently found some uh, bone fragments and some fragments from a fire with some tools around it that are 300,000 years earlier than they thought. 
humans existed? Holy moly. That's pretty crazy, right? Wouldn't it be funny if that guy who uh, has the, uh, the the creation museum with people riding dinosaurs is actually right? Oh, how we've mocked him. <laughs> he was a visionary. <laughs> um, <clears throat> no, I'm just kidding about that thing. But anyway, unless I'm right about it, then well, I saw it first. Um, so it wasn't, you know, we haven't, that's what I mean. It's like we, we see things differently for a time. We were, we, that was, the truth was that they, we weren't 300,000 years older than we thought we were because we took all the evidence we had, all the knowledge we had, all the science and experiments and everything else and archaeology all over the world to test these ideas and think these ideas through. And this is what we came to. And then all of a sudden someone does a dig down in Africa and finds something that's even older and goes, oh my gosh, crap. This is this is a different thing. It wasn't that these guys were lying. It was just they didn't have all the facts to make uh, an honest... Uh, they didn't know. So they went with the best that they know. And t- ideas change over time because people change over time. Customs change over time. Um, truth changes over time. There's a time when you talk about the man on the moon and you think of the, little, the face on the moon, you know, and, and not think that there would be a man on the moon. Um... <laughs> Because things change. Um, I have some better examples, but I'm going to wait till the end <laughs> to really blow your mind. Um, <laughs> get ready. Um, but are we so identified with the values of a previous culture that we are incapable of adapting to new truth and values? You know, um, there was a time in, 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 in the Jewish people's history where they had to have children because they had to survive. Or if you owned a farm, you had children. If you weren't some wealthy person who had slaves, you had children to work and till the land. And then women had an idea of what women were supposed to bear children, so you get all these people to work on the field and blah, blah, blah. And then so when you die off, the field continues to be grown and everything. And it's, it's crazy because you, you just realize you end up serving this piece of ground your whole life. Um, but over time, things have changed. There's been new truths. You know, we, we don't see, like, that is not the situation. Like, the man's got to have, you know, a woman and so they can have children to run things up. It's not like that anymore. People are different. It, it, it's a new truth, a new value. And um, I see how women were treated in the Bible um, or, or, or um, how we also had slavery in the Bible. I mean, think about this, Okay. Things that we've changed. I mean, they stoned people for having affairs, you know, or cheating. Usually the woman, because the man was, you know, a man. Would you say that we've have ha, we've we've have new truth and new values to that? And the truth then was, let's kill this person because they're bad and they're a sinner and awful and this. And now the truth is, is like I, we couldn't even imagine that. Um, they fed people to lions and used people to light their parties. Some of the royalty back then would you know, take people and burn them, usually Christians, huh? <laughs> and and, and uh, put some Kindle underneath their feet. Not the Kindle, but a Kindle. And they would burn them. And they would light the way. And everyone was like, oh, look, that's, oh, is that... Reverend so and so over there, <laughs> yeah, he's he's a big guy, so he's really keeping us warm. You'd probably want to go over there and sit next to him. Um, we don't do that anymore. We don't have people lamps. Um, <laughs> we don't get married at thirteen. Not, I mean, except for in the South. But no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's just cousins. Um, no, I'm kidding again. I'm from the South, so I can make those jokes. Um, they got married at thirteen, and. Uh, if 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 the girl did, wasn't a virgin or didn't bleed basically on her wedding night, if the guy was teeny weeny and she didn't bleed, that girl got killed. You know what I mean? It's just just think about this. You know what I mean? It's like those are values that we don't hold close anymore. That was that's biblical marriage. As much as people want to go, oh, biblical marriage, it was love and romance and it's fantastic. No, it was about trading. Land and bringing families together, and hopefully you fell in love over time. But the fact is, is it had a lot to do more with like procreation and bringing people together. And 
you know, property value. We think that kind of stuff's insane. Slaves. I mean, they had slaves. There's times where we hear Paul, and I don't know if it's always Paul, if it's really Paul, but we do hear Paul say, oh, be nice to your slaves. You know, like, oh, that's great. Oh, be nice to them. They had slaves. You know what I mean? It's like, I just want us to look at it. And there was no time, you don't hear Jesus get up and go, free the slaves. You don't hear Paul get up and go, free your slaves. Well, actually, he does have a whole thing where he tries to free one slave. You guys know that one? Philemon, what is it? Philemon? Is it Philemon? Philemon. Philemon. Philemon Jan. Yes. <laughs> he was a very nice guy, and they made him a name to stake after him. Um, but you know what I mean? You don't hear this. I mean, here you have the very people who were, were slaves to, to the Egyptians, um, as the story goes, and you know, you got Moses and let my people go and the, and the Red Sea and all this stuff which I think is just an analogy to almost everything in life. I, if you think about it, this whole like imprisonment, get free in the valley, hard times, reach the promised land. Oh, and guess what? The promised land's not as good as you thought it was going to be. You know, kind of. It's like, oh, that's just human expectations. Um, uh, you know, you don't hear that. So, so... You know, that's how people used the idea of saying, well, the Bible says that there's certain seeds shouldn't be mixed together. And, the, you know, people use the Bible to say interracial marriage shouldn't happen. Or they would use the Bible to say why they were racist. Or they use the Bible as an excuse to say, you know, well, we have slaves. You know, there's... Brian McLaren does this really great talk on it. And he, he shows some of the books that were written at the time where people are using the biblical reasons why slavery was of God. Okay? Um, and this wasn't that long ago. So, are we identified with the values in the previous culture? Are, are we incapable of adapting new truth and values? But obviously things are changing. Obviously we have new truths, new value. We live in a different time. If See if someone tried to live, know your life or, or live by your, your emails. Let's say all your emails came out and someone decided to put all your emails together and that was going to be their truth. Um, they gave me recent emails. Let's say to your last email today from your first email ever, and boom, there it is. You know, and it's a collection of emails, and they're like, "It's the book of." I don't do emails, so it's the book of somebody who does a lot of emails, and um, you couldn't apply that to your life. You know, because things are different for people, much less different for people two thousand years ago. Because. There's a new truth. There's new values. There's there, things change. Um, we have more information. Um, we're more advanced. We don't have to, you know. We know about evolution. We know about these things. These are things that folks didn't know about. They weren't out having archaeological digs. You know, they're going, hey, there was a guy and a good woman, and they started off, and everything was fine, and they ate a tree, and then everything went to crazy, and that's what, kind of what we have here today, and. Um, <laughs> You know, and that's why it hurts when she has kids, and that's why snakes slither on the ground, and you know that's why we have to work hard on the farms. Because I mean, you know, with twigs and thistles, I mean, there's reasons there were so much farming analogies is because people, that's the food. You know, they had to grow their own food, do this, farm, farm, farm. Um, you know, but things changed. There's new truths. Um. So does the Bible present us with permanently valid way of understanding the universe and human relationships? Okay? I'm going to ask that again. And I just want you guys to you know, think about it. So does the Bible present us with a permanently valid way of understanding the universe and human relationships? Do we still have the same human relationships that we would have had um, Middle East 2,000 years ago? Um, the same dynamic. Do we? Probably not. We have a lot of different things. Usually if you're a part of a community, you've lived and died in that community, and that community was only just a few people, and there was miles and miles. You know, you just... You just lived in a small group of people. You didn't have airplanes, or if you were going to travel, you know, you had to bring food, and you didn't. People didn't even know if you were going to make it or you were going to die on the way there. You know, those aren't things that we go through now. We have Facebook. I mean, just think about how much like Facebook and Twitter has changed the world. You know, or think about the Kindle and like 
the book. It had a really great, like, 500-year run. <laughs> the scroll before then maybe had a longer run. <laughs> Because you know that's actually what the Bible is meant is, means is it's a collection of scrolls, flat scrolls. Um, you know, how, we we're in a time where we're seeing so much truth change, so much of how we understand one another and what we understand about the earth, because we have more knowledge, we have more understanding, um, and it's also the way we we, we grow. You know, you hold when you grow, and you grow gradually over time. You have truths that you hold true, and you know, and then you get to another point, and you believe something else because you grow out of it. But at that time, that truth was what you needed. I mean, uh, if you grew up in the church, you know, do you believe the same thing about the church that you did when you were when you were first starting in the church? And I don't because I was born into it. <laughs> but um, no. You know, I don't. I mean, if you're sitting in here and you're not steaming mad right now, chances are you've grown over a time period of your thought about what God and Christianity is. And that, but there were times where those beliefs, for me, well, like for example, with Vince, um, we I remember Vince and me were doing trying. To, we I think we only did two Bible studies, but we're going to go through the Book of John. Um, and the whole literal resurrection thing came up and, you know, and I remember he was like, oh, you know, I mean, it doesn't really matter to me, you know, and and Vince isn't kind of like, he doesn't like really step his toe in the water to see how it feels, you know, he's like, I'm going to jump on in, you know, hallelujah. And, um, and he just told me flat out and I was like, and I just, my heart like sank. I was like, (gasps) and I was like, I don't. If the resurrection didn't happen, I'm done, buddy. I am done. I've got ideas for a record store. It's going to be awesome. I'm out of here. You know, like someone was going to show up with a VHS at that moment, which we didn't were even using those back then. A few years ago, someone's going to show up with a DVD. And so here, look, watch. Jesus has come out of the tomb or not come out of the tomb so we can make a decision on what we were going to do. Um, but for some reason, I was very passionate about that. And I was like, it's this way or no way at all. You know, um, and that's kind of how I was raised. It was either all true or it wasn't. You know what I mean? So, that, and I'm glad I was raised that way because I know the Bible pretty well, and I know that you know I don't just have the feeling. I don't tell people just like, well, I think it's okay to be gay because you know I just think it's you know live and let live, and that's how I feel. You know, but I also feel like I can back it up biblically if you want to sit down and have a conversation about it. So I'm glad to have both those things. The fact is, is to me, it's a no-brainer, and I'd probably be in this position where I'm at anyway because truth has changed over time. How we understand things do change. But the fact is, is that was about worshiping other gods, prostitution, concubines, all sorts of other things that... The thing, how we see it today, and how they saw it then, is not on each other's radar. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. Um, so this is where I got the contingent truth from. is is from this book by. Um, it's called Doubt and Love by Richard Holloway. Anybody know Richard? Good. <laughs> this will be new for you. Um, I'm just going to start in basically in the middle of a sentence just because if I start at the beginning of it, it's just not going to make a whole lot of sense. So, significantly, significantly, it makes the notion of truth contingent upon who and where and what we are. It does not seem to be the case that there is an absolute objective truth about the universe out there waiting for us to happen upon it. The way we might find a lost treasure or a sunken, uh, <laughs> a sunken ship. You know, it's, it's, you know, ultimate truth is, you know, I think all of us search for it and a lot of us are like, I found it. Um, what seems to occur is that at a point... A view, a point of view works for us, answers our questions, helps us to operate in life. So we use it until it no longer does the job as it was designed for. We come to realize that our viewpoints were not a piece of concrete truth that we discovered and logically permanently into our minds, 
There were practical ways of dealing with what lay before us, problem-solving devices. And when a better way of doing it and explaining things came along, we transferred our loyalties to them. The notion that there is no fixed truth out there is extremely difficult for many people to accept. And anxiety has, you know, our anxiety has a lot to do with it. And, and for me, I, I have a hard time with that. I struggle with that idea of, you know, there's this no fixed truth. Um, but I just want, I want, I want us to see is that I, I really want us to understand con, contingent truth. I really want us to understand temporal truth. That it wasn't that it was a lie. It's just we've had so many parad- paradigm, parad- paradigm shifts, paradigms, um, <laughs> so many different paradigm shifts and, and seeing things from different angles and different ways and understanding different things that it's just not this like there's this one secret hidden answer. You know, have you ever, ever seen that bumper sticker? Um, Jesus is the answer and then someone writes, what's the question? You know, um, have you seen that? What's the question? Uh, if you've lived in liberal hippie areas, you've seen it. <laughs> um, was that on your car? I bet you it was. What's the question? Did you have more? Did you have more? Authority. Question. Did you have more lead written on there too? More lead, like lead guitar. More lead. <laughs> I had a hippie friend who had that on her guitar. I too. Oh yeah. I saw hippie, hippie, hippie. One took over the line, brother. <laughs> um, that's awesome. Um, what can we put our trust in if if there is no what we want to call fixed truth? How many people have the idea of no fixed truth? Does it make you uncomfortable in this room? If you're, you will raise your hand if you want. So everybody in this room right now can handle with there being no fixed truth. Like, truth changes? Yeah? Are you good? Are you good? Are you good? You're not good with it. You're freaked you out a little bit? Okay, good. (laughs) Freaks me out a little bit, too. I'm impressed. You guys are awesome. You're like me. We've got to learn. Um, It's like a fixed gear, right? I don't understand. There's got to be black and white and this and that. And 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 when you think of things like science and how they read, you know, they they, they figure things out and then something else comes into it and everything else changes because there was something they missed or um, how we just, our truth changes over time. But does that make that truth not truth? Does that make that truth lies? It doesn't. It just says this was the best truth at the time that I had to work with. But as I grew, as I got educated, as I have knowledge and everything like that, I've learned more about life and about me and who I am and realized that this is this truth actually goes deeper. You know, I learn that all the time from studying, um, studying background books on the Bible. And you start to read like what people meant by different things and you're just going like, oh my gosh, you know. Some of this stuff has nothing to do with any of us at all. You know what I mean? And we have just like, it was like some one day someone would wear muddy shoes in the church and I was like, don't wear muddy shoes in the church. And then someone put it in the Bible and I was like, it's a sin to wear muddy shoes in the church, brothers and sisters. You know, it's like that happened. You know, I mean, there's these particular moments that it's like, oh, by the way, these are going to be gospel for the rest of our lives. Um, so what can we can we put our trust in? Because I've had people say, I mean, even to the point where I question like Adam and Eve or, or, or Jonah and, and things like that. You know, I've been like, I don't know. I think those are kind of more stories to tell us how to, you know, how to live. And uh, to make a point, I don't think these are literal. And people go, oh, if you start moving one, if you start taking one thing away, it all falls down. Now, first of all, I don't want a faith that's built on a house of cards. That is a house of cards. Because um, I'm shaky all the time. Um, and you just go, boop, and it's gone, you know. Um, but here we had Vince and me, who now, like I was telling the story of Vince, is now I, I don't, resurrection, if you showed me a video of the tomb empty and not nothing happening, happening, that wouldn't change what I do today. I don't even think it would change me from following Christ. I could say, you can go as far as the, I see the disciples sneak in in the middle of the night, pick up the body, and walk away with it. Bernie style. Uh, <laughs> now, you might say, well, Jay, I'm crazy. No, it's just my truth is different now than it was then. You know? The fact is, I choose to believe in the resurrection. You know? I, my choice is, hey, man, 
that third day, a rock, Jesus came out, bam, there was angels, all three different ways happened all at once, you know, all, you know, because there's three different stories and different people meet Jesus at different times. It is all happening because I like it. I feel it. It's a part and part of my faith, and I still hold it sacred. And I still wince sometimes if I hear myself saying this. But it's my truth is is in in something different. Um, that's not a make or break. You know, virgin birth for me is not a make or break anymore. Um, especially understanding now that you know what we say is virgin really meant young lady. You know, it's like. We just have to be open to this. And I think that's why a lot of people today are just either completely done with their faith because they find some things like this and they're just like, screw it, I don't want this faith anymore. And that's very much how I was at a particular time in my life. Or they're like, you know, or they just say, okay, I'm going to ignore some of this stuff and I'm just going to get into it and it's all going to be factual. So you get these two real severe ones, like God is dead. You know, and then God is on the throne, brothers and sisters, you know what I mean? And he wants you to do every jot and tittle of the Bible. Do not question it. You get these severe middles. And I think there's a third way, which I kind of hope revolution is that kind of third way. I don't even want to say it's balanced because I fear balance as well. Um, It's usually seen as to be healthy, um, but, you know, I don't see how that works because it would be like a, you know, well, I'm just as evil as I am good. Um, Anyway, and passionate people are really not balanced people. You know, do you think John the Baptist was balanced? <laughs> Jesus didn't seem even balanced. He's like, oh, there's a hey, Zacchaeus. I'm coming to your house. You know, what? You know, um, hey, I'm going to spit in the mud to tell a story to put in this guy's eyes. And all my answers are questions. Questions. <laughs> I'm just saying, Jesus was. <laughs> he's a cantankerous. Um, <laughs> But what I want to say is this is, is, is for me is, is that grace and compassion, my love for God that I don't know what God is because honestly there was a time that I knew what God was and God was in, a, in the box of Jay and, and looked a whole lot like me. I've decided that I cannot have the corner on God and I don't think anyone has a corner on God because if they do then they are God. And um, I love my Bible. It's the most important book it, 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 to me. It, this, I read all my other books based on this book. It's kind of crazy, except for Batman. <laughs> but probably something has to do with that. Um, and then on the eighth day, God created Batman. Um, <laughs> and he was good. Um, you know, so it, it's it's this is important stuff to me. You know, this is stuff that's to, to my heart. And I can understand if some people here or some people listening online are going like, oh my God, I can't just believe you said that whole thing about the body being robbed in the middle of the night. And you're gonna, I can't believe I just said that. But it came to me because it was the most irreverent way I could think of it. Um, because it's the grace, it's compassion, it's the love of God. God and loving neighbor as self as being the most important things, that makes me excited about Christianity. It's different. Because then I found out my neighbor is also my enemy. I'm like, what? <laughs> my neighbor's the guy I hate too? Or the gal I hate too? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it's true. <laughs> um, what about that preacher guy, you know, the one? And he's like going, yep, that's your neighbor too. You know, and it's like, suck. Uh, yeah, I gotta love everybody and take the high road. And trust me, I try to take the high road as as much as I can. And yeah, that's a s- sucky road. <laughs> that is the, uh, you know, ugh. you know, you think, oh, I'm gonna do this and everything's gonna be better. And you're just like, oh no, the other person's gonna take advantage of the high road. And that's awesome. Um, but then I take the low road and I feel like shit anyway. So it's you can't win either way. Um, but that's you know it's the thing that keeps pulling me to the life of messy faith. You know what is it? It's that. It's that stuff. It's grace. It's compassion. You know, and you say, well, Jay, there's you know we could have that without the church. But the plus, the extra little bit there for me is that what keeps pulling me back to the life of Jesus. What keeps pulling me back to the Bible. What keeps causing me to want to understand what Paul wrote and what Paul didn't write, what it meant and what it didn't mean. It's that thing that keeps drawing me back in that I can't get away from. You know, because there's no doubt in my mind that I could not, I could live a great, moral, awesome life and, and, and loving, compassionate life and completely get rid of Christianity if I could. But there's something that won't let me. 
And what I find interesting is that now, because I'd say that, there's a lot of people right now who would hear, would hear this or, or hear me talk and say, I don't think you're a real Christian because of the, some of the stuff you said. And uh, when my new book comes out, I'm sure a lot of people will say that. Um, but the fact is, is I keep getting pulled into this faith. So if anybody's a Christian, sucka. Um, <laughs> sucka. <laughs> Just, I don't know why. Um, <laughs> I'm a Christian. If you, I always tell people, like, you know, you want to see real Christians, go to an MCC church. Go to a church where you see a bunch of people who have been told their whole life they can't worship God. And then they do, they go, oh, I'm going to build my own church and I'm going to worship God. You know, people who are dying to get in the doors and we're sitting there, you know, with the, sorry, we're the, uh, the gospel police and, you know, God doesn't approve of you and blah, blah, blah. And it says right here in the book. And... Um, that if I read it at a sixth grade level, it tells me you're horrible. Um, you know, it's true. The Bible's a hard book to read and understand. I wish I could say, oh, just go get it and open it up and just start reading it. Uh, I don't even know. I don't, I don't think I could say that to anybody because I did that and it freaked me out. And I hated myself until I started getting into backgrounds and understanding the history behind certain things and looking at Greek and Hebrew and all that stuff. You know, I mean it's not that everybody shouldn't read the Bible, it's just you should realize is that it's such a deep book that was written in such a different time that uh, the, the context isn't explained by like, there's not like someone in here explaining the context to us, you know? It doesn't have, we don't have a narrator that we need like, back then, what was, you know, <laughs> people were obsessed with wooden nickels. Um, you know they had wooden money for a while, I learned that the other day. Hence the term, don't take any wooden nickels. Um, so that's some, these are my questions. This isn't this isn't a solid answer sermon. This is this is an idea of of questions. Is have we monopolized the truth? Is the fact that reason we see so many preachers that are so angry and and hateful have they monopolized the truth? You know, or, or do we decide when we want to monopolize the truth? We're very good at that. We're like, okay, for two thousand years, I think it was this was that fifteen hundred years. Okay, we've got it taken care of, and then this guy Martin Luther comes along and says, well, "Wait a second, things have gotten out of hand. There's a different type of truth than there was before. This isn't the truth. The, the real truth is is we're saved by grace. Blah blah blah." Um, no man is better than any other man. The Pope has no rule. Blah blah blah. It's you know ninety five theses. You know and and uh, all this happens and and the reforms and the church is a different place. And what happens? What happens? Right now, some of the angriest, meanest preachers are reformed theologians. You know, um, because they stopped growing there. Okay, well, you got the printing press, we got Martin Luther, we got Calvin, it kind of covered a lot of bases, boom, we're done, you know. Um, but they got stuck in a truth. You know, a, a truth that, that truth, but the fact is, as things have changed, the thing is, we have archaeologists, we have people who go, okay, you know, the pastoral epistles that a lot of Reformed theology is built on, you know, probably weren't written by Paul, you know, and actually may have been reaction to Paul, you know, and stuff like that. Had I mean, Martin Luther didn't want James, the book of James in the Bible, much less, you know, I mean, if he would have known that, he would have been like, take it out! You know, it's epistles of straw. Um, but instead we get stuck in that time with no personal growth, with no uh, no uh, con- contingent truth, no temporal truths, no new truths. Because we, we want to get comfortable and stuck in that moment because it's safe. But the fact is, is when that moment doesn't work anymore, when that truth does not seem to get us to the next level of where we need to go, when that truth does not bring growth, we have to release it and be grateful that it was a part of our life for a time and that it gave us peace for a time. But if we're going to get stuck there, we start hurting other people because the world changes, customs change, people change. And the fact is, is a lot of people in the church today are fighting battles that were over 500 years ago, 2,000 years ago or that have since been disproven or seen differently. Um, you know, I mean, part of part of uh, Constantine feeling that he could kill and slaughter all these people was because he was baptized. And that kind of covered it all. That's a whole different kind of truth, right? That's that kind of like, I'm searching for loophole truth. <laughs> it's like the kids who are like, oh, well, we just don't put the penis in the vagina and we can do everything else and it's not sex. 
You know, that kind of thing. Like the assemblies of God, growing up assemblies of God, we were really good at that, you know. We can do everything else but. Oh, and but. Um, <laughs> no vagina and everything's cool. Seriously, I mean, that's how they thought. It's like we found this awesome loophole. Um, don't think about it anymore. Um, and it's like trying to find these things. You know, and those are maybe good truths at one point, but eventually you realize these are not good truths. I don't know. Um, I, if you're confused, I'm confused too. Um, not really. I, I really do understand that we've got to grow and we've got to start thinking differently and allowing God to expose us to truths and we should be able to talk about these things without killing each other. You know, it's funny to me that you can't have conversations with a lot of Reformed theologians because the fact they are just set in their ways and they're angry and they're upset and they're mad and they call you a heretic and they're doing exactly what happened to their heroes. They're doing what happened, you know, they're vilifying someone because of new ideas and maybe a new reformation, a new thought. And to me, that's that's heartbreaking. Um, and I'm not going against Reformed theology because there's a lot of Reformed theology that I love, by the way. And I have the Re- Lutheran rose tattooed on my legs. So I'm just saying that's my example for today. Um, all right, that's it. I'd like to thank you all for coming out. I want to remind you that um, we have the sign-up sheet in the back for, for David. Yeah, see events if you want to help David eat. If you don't want him to starve to death. Um, and there's Tuesday night. See Vince. There's going to be a movie about Bishop Gene Robbins at a church on 6.30 Tuesday night. I don't remember what church it is, but Vince does know right off the top of his head, I'm sure. Um, I'm going to pass this hat, which is really sweaty and nasty, so I apologize. <laughs> but it is the sweat of Jay. Um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Why we're waiting for it to come around? <laughs> I hope this is what one of the things that's done is allowed you to to be encouraged to open up to other people's truths as well as yours. Other people of other faiths and other religions and other ideas that you're able to sit with them and talk with them and have conversations with them um, and walk in humility. That's what I really hope is that we all can learn to walk in humility because I think Christianity is a really cool thing but I think it's just so screwed up right now and I really, really hope that we can all learn to walk in humility and and love. You know, to me, I think there's hope. Um, I hope it doesn't have to die. I've got friends who think it needs to die and, uh, you know, Peter Rollins and he may be right but I have hope that maybe things can change and uh, until it's dead, I'll keep the hope alive. All right. Have a good week. We've got to get out of here because all those open micers want to get in. But this is our coffee hour, so please talk to each other, chat, have a drink. Tip your bartender.